Hello, Entertainment and New Media Law class. Welcome to the first lecture in this module of our class. In this class, I want to talk about some of the background for how I'm thinking about this class and how we're structuring this class. And one of the main themes that I think informs this class is the concept of convergence, of media convergence. How are various different forms of media, audio, uh, video, written word, music, film, all sorts of different kinds of media, converging and coming together and being made available across various kinds of platforms so that you can have access to different kinds of media in all sorts of different ways. Uh, a good example of that, and one of the reasons I'm doing this class in this kind of hybrid for format, is this class itself. So you are uh, looking at a PowerPoint slide, which is a certain kind of uh, text media. Um, you are listening to my voice here, which is a an audio recording. Uh, all of this has been bundled into a video. It's being delivered to you over the internet. You may be watching it on your laptop, you may be watching it on your phone or your iPad or some other kind of device. If you wanted to, I suppose, you could um, beam it to your television. So this is a good example of convergence in itself. Um, and this theme of convergence has been a very big uh, theme in media studies and in media um, since at least the dawn of the internet era. I certainly remember uh, in the mid-1990s when I was a young lawyer and the internet was a relatively new thing, a lot of discussion about multimedia. They, they weren't quite using the term convergence yet, but a lot of discussion about multimedia. Um, then the notion that you would have a smartphone in your pocket uh, from which you know you could pull out and pull down and watch a movie or something like that was really just a, a, a gleam in some forward-thinking uh, people's eyes. It wasn't really something that was possible, and of course now it's possible. In the future, even more incredible things, I think, um, will be possible. So our topic in this class is this idea of convergence and how media convergence intersects with existing legal frameworks and how legal frameworks may change or need to change or ought to change in relation to the ongoing phenomenon of media convergence. So let's talk for a little bit in this lecture about what is this idea of media convergence and what are, just as a broad brush overview, some of the legal frameworks that will apply and that we'll be digging into in further classes in this module. So first, this question of convergence, and um, I'm going to give you some ways of thinking about convergence by a media scholar named Henry Jenkins, who is now, I believe, out at USC, who used to be at MIT. Uh, and Jenkins has written some academic work as well as a lot of popular work on this question of convergence. And this is taken from an article that Jenkins published in the MIT Technology Review in 2001. Um, and if you'll notice, uh, Jenkins at that time is uh, pushing back a little bit against some concepts that were floating around at the time about what convergence is and what it means. Now, if you look at that date, 2001, uh, 15 or 16 years ago, um, depending on when you're taking this class or hearing this lecture. Um, that is obviously an eternity in the Internet age. Quite a lot has happened uh, technologically. Quite a lot has happened politically and, and socially. Uh, and, and a fair amount has happened in the legal landscape since that time. But I, So I think it's interesting to look at what Jenkins comes up with. A lot of what he's saying, I think, is still... Um, very important for today, but we can also think about it in terms of, you know, how have things perhaps changed. So Jenkins is going to break up this idea of convergence into a number of different uh, layers or buckets or categories. 
So the first thing he talks about is technological convergence. So the idea that um, where previously the technology relied on electrons, basically. So if you think about old uh, cathode ray tube television screens or uh, even tube radio sets, right? This is um, relying on the properties of electrons and electricity to communicate information. And now what Jenkins is suggesting is that all these different ways of communicating information, whether it's over radio, whether it's um, television broadcasting, are now all converted to the digital domain. Now, of course, the digital domain involves, you know, the layer uh, layer of physics, too. Everything has to obey the laws of physics. So when you're communicating information digitally, you're still in, involving, um, you know, atoms and then more fundamental laws of physics. But the point is, everything is digital now. And when everything is digital, you've got a medium, a kind of currency, so to speak, that will allow anything to be exchanged, any kind of media to be exchanged. In the past, you couldn't really readily convert, say, a radio broadcast to a television broadcast. Of course, you could do it, you could retransmit it, you could record it and retransmit it or something like that. Um, but there was there were issues about loss of signal, loss of integrity of the data, um, you know, the more re more recordings you make of an analog tape, the information degrades, the data degrades, the quality degrades. That doesn't happen in the digital domain. So the second thing Jenkins mentions is economic convergence. So here he is suggesting that the entertainment industry in particular is beginning to integrate. And he talks here about the horizontal integration. So if you think about the way industries are uh, structured or the way the delivery of a, of a good or a service is structured, you can think about a vertical kind of integration. So, you know, how are things produced? How's the most basic unit? Uh, let's take something a little more tangible, like um, building a railroad, right? So you've got steel that you need for the rail uh, lines, Somebody is producing the steel. And then you need someone to take that steel and to uh, manufacture the raw steel into uh, railroad lines. So somebody's got to do that. Then you have to have somebody that uh, goes and, and surveys well, the, where the railroad will go and find the right place for it to go. Someone's got to do that. And then someone has to build it. Someone has to actually put the railroad uh, lines and ties down onto the place where the surveyor came up with. Right? And then someone has to build the engines and the rail cars and engineer those. And then uh, someone has to um, actually be able to pilot the engine, you know, be an engineer, all those sorts of things. So you could have different companies delivering all those services, or you could vertically, vertically integrate that into one company delivering all those services. And indeed, we, we saw all that in the 19th century, um, and that was what led to the, the first uh, comprehensive antitrust laws in the United States was the integration of those industries and the question of whether that was a healthy thing for the economy or not. So that's kind of a vertical integration. But a horizontal level would be entities that are delivering a service at the same level. So let's take, again, railroads. Let's say that you have uh, two different companies that are um, constructing railroad uh, lines out of raw steel. Those two companies are um, competing with each other. They're each doing that. Um, let's say that there are different gauges of railroad lines for different purposes. So you have those two companies. So those are horizontal competitors. And again, uh, part of what the antitrust laws in the 19th century uh, initially were designed to do was to limit to a certain degree the ability of horizontal uh, competition to be concentrated. Because, you know, when you think about this kind of concentration, especially with horizontal competition, because then, of course, you've got um, competitors or potential competitors at the same level um, agreeing not to compete, and that leads to oligopoly or monopoly, obviously, hurts competition.
And so Jenkins uh, suggested back in 2001 that this is what is happening in the entertainment industry, that you will see um, a small number of large players controlling a variety of outlets. Jenkins also talks about social or organic convergence. And here what he's talking about is how consumers uh, acquire and use information. What kinds of outlets do consumers use to get information? So whereas in the past it might have been that people would get their uh, hard news from a paper newspaper and would get their uh, softer or local news from a local television news broadcast, again, Jenkins said those channels will begin to converge. And then cultural convergence. Jenkins talks about forms of creativity, ways in which uh, regular people will use media and different kinds of media to communicate with each other and to create their own forms of entertainment and the like. And then Jenkins talks about global convergence. So the fact that you're transforming atoms to bits and you're uh, creating this new digital media and that this is accessible globally over the internet means that various different cultural channels that would have remained separate or at least somewhat distinct will begin to blend and merge. So I think if you look at all these areas of convergence that Jenkins was talking about in 2001, in many ways they uh, definitely resonate today, maybe even in ways that Jenkins himself would not have fully anticipated. Certainly global convergence, certainly uh, degrees of cultural convergence, social convergence, uh, technological convergence. Maybe the one that is the most interesting, though, and that perhaps didn't quite play out exactly the way Jenkins thought it would, is this question of economic convergence. So when Jenkins is writing in 2001, some of the big players are, that were around in 2001 are not even really around anymore. And some of the big players today weren't really around or around substantially in 2001. So the market, perhaps, has not developed in exactly the way that Jenkins was thinking in 2001. It has developed in ways that perhaps are more competitive than he would have thought, or in some ways, perhaps, there are still movements toward uh, horizontal integration. And that's uh, that question of how the markets, how the business environment, how the entities that are... Um, delivering content, creating content, and able to do that, um, how they are competing with each other and relating to each other, is going to be one of the themes of our class. So it's one of the themes of how the law is going to relate to this era of new media. Uh, you know, one of the things I think I put in one of the early course descriptions here was talking about the phenomenon of the professional YouTuber. This was something, of course, that didn't exist in 2001. Um, so now you have people like, uh, say, PewDiePie, the guy who reviews uh, video games, uh, making millions of dollars uh, putting up uh, YouTube content. And it's, and it's content that, in the not-too-distant past, nobody would have really paid any attention to at all. So you do have that phenomenon. You do have individuals who are able to not only make a living, but make a very good living. Um, creating and curating and producing content. But the question is, how long will that kind of thing last? How long will that sort of disruption last? Uh, and or to what degree will, the, will, will there be a broader kind of um, corporate control concentrated in the hands of a few very small media companies over that kind of content? And in, indeed, the acquisition of YouTube by Google uh, raises that very kind of question, because um, while Google isn't uh, owning or controlling PewDiePie per se, Google does control the channel. Uh, and what Google does with things like DMCA takedown notices on that channel can have a big impact. And we'll see, see that when we uh, talk more about the DMCA. So that was Jenkins in 2001. Uh, this quote that I have up on the screen is from an article in The Economist 
April 17th, 2000. So around the time that Jenkins is writing about what he sees as the future of convergence. And I think the really interesting thing about this quote is it's also talking about this idea of convergence that was in the air that people were talking about in the late 90s, mid to late 90s and early 2000s. But notice what The Economist says in this article, and it's really kind of amusing even to look at it. You know, uh, the Internet was seen as making uh, the media business in the 21st century. It was going to slash costs. It was going to boost revenues. It was going to lower barriers to entry. But the Internet has not lived up to these ho hopes. Uh, and see this quote from Ted Leon Leon uh, Leonsis, president of the Interactive Properties Group at AOL, America Online, which back in 2000 was a big deal. Digital entertainment has been a failure. Well, um, that is not only a statement about the present as of 2000, it's supposed to be a statement about what we can expect to come, and, and uh, obviously couldn't be any more wrong, could it? Um, digital entertainment certainly is not a failure. Um, a quote like that doesn't and didn't anticipate Amazon, didn't anticipate Netflix, didn't anticipate Hulu. Um, so very interesting to see what people were thinking about at that time and not realizing what was going to really come about. Now here's a quote from about 10 years ago in The Equ Economist, 2006. Now the uh, tune has changed by 2006. So five or six years on from that 2000 quote, um, talks about convergence. What this means is the coming together of previously separate, separate communication and entertainment services. That's exactly what we mean by convergence. Um, and then notice this quote from someone at uh, British Telecom. The freedom for consumers to use any service under any circumstances they choose to. Again, that's a really nice uh, definition of what we're what I mean by convergence in this class. Um, and you know, this uh, quote by the guy from France, Telecom: "We want to bring simplicity to our customers. The first step towards a digital paradise." Well, that certainly has resonances with what we looked at at the very beginning of our Internet Law class, the first module earlier this semester, which is this idea of, the, of cyberspace as something truly unique, as something truly exceptional. So this notion of, of media convergence is very much tied toward, uh, with ideas of Internet exceptionalism. Now, I don't know how much this guy, D.D.A. Lombard, really... Uh, believed in internet exceptionalism, how much this is kind of marketing hype. But nevertheless, this is the, the vision, that it will be seamless, um, that you will have whatever media entertainment you want at your fingertips, uh, and it will, it will be transparent as to the channel in which it comes, comes from. Um, so whatever whatever the source of the media, whatever the ultimate way in which the media was created, it's not going to matter to you as the consumer because you're going to have immediate access to whatever you want. That's the the at least the business vision or the the quasi utopian vision of media convergence. Here's another quote from just last year in the Economist, and the thing I want you to notice from this quote is that now it when it's speaking of of these ideas about convergence, it has to include social networks. So even as of 2006, there's really not much of a focus in, in that particular article we looked at in The Economist on social networks. There's still this sense that there are going to be, um, you know, providers of traditional kinds of entertainment, um, you know, movies or films or novels or short stories or whatever, uh, and it's just going to be more accessible. But now w there's a stronger sense of the role that social networks play in curating and cultivating and promoting uh, various kinds of media. Um, and so that goes along with uh, the user base. It goes along with the potential revenues and the advertising. So the revenues and the advertising are very much tied to the concepts that we're looking at in this class of how media is accessed and used and 
how the law may or may not regulate it. The uh, question of advertising in that same uh, issue of The Economist, uh, which, was, which was an issue that focused on new media, um, had these graphs in them which just show kind of traditional advertising spend, um, you know, kind of classified ads, um, other television, newspaper, magazine, radio, and so on. Um, and then uh, on the right side on your screen, the spend on social media type advertising. And what you can see when you look at these, these graphs is that the percentage of overall, first of all, overall advertising spend is, is dramatically increasing. And secondly, the, the percentage of overall advertising spend that is kind of traditional media to new media. So if you look at the chart on the left, you know, television, uh, that kind of blue column, and internet, that kind of greenish column, almost the same amount uh, as of 2016-2017, uh, which is kind of an extraordinary thing to think about. Um, and then if you look at, at the right side, um, obviously the, the overall amount of social media spending is less than kind of traditional television or what we might call traditional internet advertising, but it's climbing. Um, so, the, uh, of course, adver in, in the model in which we have done lots of kinds of media, uh, at least certainly television media, here in the United States, it's largely supported by advertising, and certainly the um, parts of at least the Internet and the World Wide Web, initially, uh, in terms of business models, were supported by advertising. And, of course, um, one of the most important parts of the web today, which is search, uh, dominated by Google, is supported significantly by, by advertising. So this question of where there is advertising revenue um, in, in terms of the market is very much going to influence the question of, of media convergence and how media is or isn't converging. So that's a bit of background in terms of what I'm talking about regarding convergence. I also am uh, posting to the site a... Um, a TED Talk that deals with this same issue. And what I want to do in the last few minutes of this lecture is just give some of the background of the law that we'll be looking at in this module and that uh, relates to this question of convergence. And, you know, one way you can conceive of all this and that I think is a, a useful paradigm is you can, in terms of the law, is that it is a communications law issue and an intellectual property law issue. There are other areas of law, too, of course, commercial law and contract law and, and so on. But these are the two that I, I think for our topic that I want to focus on. Communications law and intellectual property law, and in particular, how do communications law and intellectual property law themselves converge? How do they interface with each other? Um, what are the areas of, of tension? What are the places where that interface is um, smoother or less smooth? So I just, in these next couple of slides, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on communication law, very, very brief, and a little bit, again, very brief background on intellectual property law. I know some of you will have had intellectual property law classes. Some of you um, won't have had them. You'll have had a little bit of it in the Internet Law module, but we'll talk about it a bit here. So first, uh, let's talk a little bit about communications law. So what is communication law all about? I think you can break it up into a number of broad areas of concern. One area of concern historically has been the allocation of spectrum. So if you think about communications law historically as really first dealing with radio, broadcast radio, um, and then dealing with broadcast television. These are all analog era, pre-digital era um, kinds of technologies. And when you have a, a non-digital technology, certainly with, with things like the radio spectrum, you only have a certain amount of 
bandwidth. You have a, 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 a limited amount of bandwidth. Uh, and not only do you have a limited amount of bandwidth, but if you are broadcasting a signal on a certain frequency, uh, and that is in geographic proximity to someone else broadcasting a signal on uh, that same frequency or a nearby frequency, there's the potential for interference. And you've probably experienced this if you've listened to, you know, broadcast radio um, driving across states or something like that where you're listening to your favorite station and you begin to get a little bit out of range and then you begin to pick up a little bit of another station that might be um, at the same place or a, or a similar similar place on the dial and you start to get interference. Well, this, uh, you know, again, with something like radio can still be a real concern uh, and it was a very significant concern early on with radio and television. And if you think about this further, you know, you, you've got to have some kind of system to avoid interference of saying, well, you know, this station or this broadcasting entity gets this piece of the spectrum. Um, this entity gets the next piece of the spectrum. Um, and, you know, if you're going to try to allocate that, you've got to find, figure out, well, how are we going to do that? Now, you know, with real property, you can allocate those kinds of rights um, by setting up fences um, and literally physically excluding somebody. Um, and, you know, ultimately you can resort to force, but in terms of the rule of law, you can, you know, have a system of uh, creating a deed and creating boundaries of, of property rights and recording the deeds and uh, having, you know, the, the, the sheriff come in if someone has, has trespassed and looking at the deeds and, and so on. Um, and it's, it's kind of tangible and obvious because, you know, you're standing on this piece of land and you can put down surveyor's marks. Well, you could do spectrum the same way. You could just say there's some kind of way in which somebody puts up a fence around the spectrum. They claim it. They have some uh, historic or prior claim to it. Maybe there's a, uh, you kind of stake out your rights as a squatter or something like that. And then you begin to build fences around it. But it's much more difficult to do that. I think you can see as a practical matter, um, it's relatively easy if you have broadcasting equipment to interfere with somebody's signal. And it's relatively hard um, to police those boundaries, or at least a little bit harder. And it's also difficult to decide, well, who gets the first right? I mean, real property law has very deep roots in the common law uh, and very historic roots. And so there's sort of a social acceptance, um, at least in sort of constitutional, you know, broadly free market-based de democracies, there's a kind of social acceptance of the idea that, well, there are these historic property rights. Somebody has had ownership going back and we trace that, and we don't really raise, in mo in many cases, we don't really raise too much question about it. We might raise questions, you know, if it's, um, let's say it's a Native American land claim or something like that, right? we'll raise questions. But but often we, we kind of just accept it. Well, how do you do that with something new like broadcast spectrum? Uh, and so that's part of the area of communications law. There are different ways that it's done um, and has been done. You know, there have been auctions that have set up. There are... Um, uh, qualifications to prove that you've got actually the capacity to operate effectively in a market and broadly speaking for the public interest in order to get spectrum. So that would be one area of concern. As we talk about the internet, um, that is a different kind of concern. Of course, just given the laws of physics um, and the kind of capacity of the cables and routers and switches that carry internet traffic, internet bandwidth is not unlimited either. Um, but the amount of available bandwidth and the ability to create patch, packet switched traffic without the same kind of interference is a very different kind of proposition than something like over the air broadcasts, but it's something that communications law thinks about. Um, a related piece of this is market regulation. So let's say we've allocated spectrum, if that's something we have to do, and then we might decide, well, since this there's some kind of government grant being given here to someone 
a license to use this spectrum, is there anything we want to want to require? Do we want to say that, well, you can't only carry political advertising from one side of the aisle? There's some kind of fairness rule, perhaps. Um, are there certain kinds of signals that you, you are obligated to retransmit um, and not block? Um, are there interconnections that you're obligated to make with other providers and other geographic locations? How do we deal with the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure you have to create? So when you get into something like uh, telephone communications, for example, because you know, radio is an area, telephone is an area, television is an area, um, and eventually cable television will be an area. How do you attach those wires to poles in a local municipality? How do you get a right of way to do that? Right, All those kinds of things, that piece of infrastructure, part of communications law, broadly speaking. What about content? Again, you're giving some kind of government grant or license. Um, the First Amendment presumably applies, but what are the limits? Is, are there going to be rules about obscenity? Um, are there going to be rules about whether certain kinds of programming uh, is accessible in a local area? For example, rules about you know sports team blackouts. Um, are there going to be rules about having to carry certain kinds of local programming? You may notice uh, if you have cable television, somewhere on your dial there's going to be a public access channel, and you probably have some, um, you know, some guy from your city or your local area or something like that, you know, cooking Italian food or something with really bad sound and video quality. Or maybe your local school, my local school in my town, the kids put on a uh, broadcast about things that are going on in, in the school. How does that get on TV? It's because historically cable television have local access carriage requirements uh, and they have to allocate certain channels for, for local programming. So you, are you going to have rules like that or not? Those all those sorts of things are part of communication law. What about market access? Now, you know, again, we're looking at a resource. If we're talking about spectrum, we're looking at a resource that is scarce. If we're talking about uh, certain kinds of infrastructure, uh, you know, let's say telephone lines, again, you're talking about a resource that has some degree of scarcity. Um, and when there's scarcity and there's the possibility of one or a few entities controlling that scarcity, you have the potential for market failures. You have the potential for monopolization or um, anti-competitive oligopolies. So what do you do about that? Do you have rules that specify when and under what circumstances there can be a new entrant? Um, how does somebody new get into the game? That's always a big question uh, in competition law and policy. And then you might have things like, you know, again, if you've got infrastructure that's going through state and local areas, um, or you've uh, simply got transmissions that are going in and through state and local areas, can the state and local area uh, charge a franchise fee, a tariff, some other kinds of tax, and how does that how does that work? Um, so all those kinds of things could be part of, or, or are you going to prohibit that kind of thing and have a national policy that says there are no state and local fees? You know, how do you do that? That's all part of communication law. And then you have concerns about consumer protection. Uh, what about rate regulation? You're giving a license. There are certain um, bits of infrastructure, there's going to, it's not going to be kind of just, likely not going to be just normal competition, uh, where it's relatively easy for a new entrant to come in and compete on price or quality or service or something like that. Um, and if that's going to be the case, should there be caps on the rates that are charged to consumers? Should there be procedures through which uh, rates are, are determined? A very good analogy here is another really important area of highly regulated public infrastructure, which is energy. So um, in the United States, we have a significant amount of energy regulation. There was a period in which energy was um, significantly deregulated. 
Um, it is, to a significant extent, deregulated today, but nevertheless, there's a lot of uh, regulation and control, or at least um, limits, over things like the rates the utility company can charge to individual um, consumers. Uh, what about access to people with disabilities? What about uh, who's going to regulate the possibility of mergers um, and acquisitions, especially, again, on the antitrust front as the industry potentially can consolidate? All of these sorts of things are areas that, broadly speaking, communications law deals with. In the United States, there are a number of statutes that are kind of the foundation for our national communications law policy um, and that are you know, still broadly applicable today. One is the Communications Act of 1934. So the Communications Act of 1934, as you might gather, um, initially is broadly concerned with uh, radio broadcast. And in the uh, Communications of Act of 1934, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, was established. So the FCC, of course, is the regulatory, uh, the federal regulatory body that is making rules and doing enforcement, and that is um, absolutely central to communications policy in the United States today. We saw a little bit of that in our Internet Law module, of course, in the debate over network neutrality, um, through which the FCC is um, regulating certain aspects of internet commerce and effectively is arguing that um, the internet, the World Wide Web, is part of this kinds of communication infrastructure like broadcast television or radio or telephones and so on, and that's part of that big debate. The Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, or CALEA, involves the ability of uh, law enforcement to obtain certain kinds of information uh, from certain information providers like telephone companies. Um, you know, can the, can the FBI plant a trace device on a telephone line in order to figure out numbers that are being dialed? Um, can the uh, FBI get from the telephone company subscriber information? Those sorts of things. Um, covered by CALEA. Uh, if you take the computer crime and or the national security modules in my internet law sequence, we'll talk a little bit more about CALEA, but we'll also talk about the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. So the ECPA is kind of like, in a way, CALEA for email. Um, and there are huge debates today about the applicability of the ECPA to cloud providers and jurisdictional questions and so on. Um, the Cable Communications Act of 1984, the Satellite Home Viewer Act, obviously these are statutes that are dealing with uh, the development of the cable and satellite television industry, uh, and likewise the Cable Television Consumer Protection and Competition Act, and then the Telecommunications Act of 1996. So the Telecom Act of 1996 is really um, a, a, certain, a significant overhaul of the 1934 Communications Act. And it's the 1996 Communications Act that has these different um, classifications of things in terms of a communication or information service, and that is taken up in the FCC's Open Internet Order and was the subject of the case in the D.C. Circuit that we looked at in the internet law class. There are also various state and local laws and rules that relate to communication law. And, you know, if you think about it a little bit, because communication law involves infrastructure resources like poles and wires uh, that have to go through local areas, there's got to be some kind of overlap between the state and local rules and these federal rules. So that's our just broad general introduction to the themes of communication law. What about intellectual property law? So if you've had an IP class, this will be familiar to you. Uh, if you haven't, you've heard a little bit about this in the Internet Law module, but just as a refresher, uh, 
the areas that I have up here on the screen, patent, trademark, trade secret, copyright, are traditionally thought of as kind of the broad areas that comprise intellectual property. So a patent, really a utility patent, um, is a uh, way of having an exclusive right over an invention. Some uh, The require, basic requirement is that it's new, useful, and non-obvious. Um, there you have to you know file a specific uh, form of document and make certain disclosures to the patent office. Um, the disclosures you make are examined against the prior art, against the the, the universe as defined by the statute of um, what has come before. And you have to show that you've really done something different. You've done something new, you've done something that wouldn't have been obvious to a person of ordinary skill in the art. Um, and then it's defined by the patent claims. So in a sense, a patent is, is very formalistic. A trademark is an, a name, word, symbol, or device that identifies the um, source of goods or services, and it goes with the uh, goodwill of the entity that is selling those goods or services or, or, or distributing those goods or services. In the United States, you, you acquire trademark rights through use of the mark in commerce, and you can formalize those rights through a federal registration. In most of the world, you require trademark rights initially through registration, and then generally you have to use in commerce to keep the rights. In any event, the trademark rights are about goodwill, about brand names, and we looked at uh, trademarks as they intersect with internet law in some degree of detail in the internet law class when we did domain names. A uh, trade secret is something that has economic that something that is kept secret or confidential, and that has economic value in virtue of being secret or confidential. Now we usually think of something like you know the uh, secret recipe for Coca Cola or something like that. So a formula certainly can be a trade secret, but it can be much broader. It can be uh, confidential information that is say a uh, a pricing list, a customer list, things like that, that that aren't broadly known or knowable. And then the last piece here is copyright. Now, I put copyright last on this list because really I think for most of what we're talking about in this class, in this new media law class, copyright is really the main body of intellectual property law that's um, going to be really important and that's going to have some unique ways of interfacing with communications law. Certainly there are patents that relate to uh, new media. We looked a little bit in internet law at, at some patent issues, like we looked at the uh, clear correct case, which involves the transmission of uh, a patent that covers the transmission of certain kinds of data and whether that, you know, transmitted internationally gives jurisdiction in the International Trade Commission, you know, some things like that. There are patents on basic technologies, but it's really not the focus of what we're doing in this class. Trademarks as well um, can be very important. Certainly in media industries, a brand uh, for something like, say, a series of films like Lord of the Rings, you know, um, a brand name, a, a, the title of a single film generally cannot function as a trademark, but the title of a series maybe can function as a trademark. That can be important. Um, but again, it's not really the main focus of this, this class. Trade secrets, there, there could be trade secrets underlying products or services that people are making available online, but it's not so much, I don't think, a media issue. The real issues in media are copyright. So what does copyright do? Copyright uh, under U.S. law allows an exclusive a certain sorts of exclusive rights over original expression that is fixed in some tangible medium of expression. Um, the exclusive rights are set out in the Copyright Act and they include things like reproduction, that is copying, um, distribution, to a certain degree transmission, as I'll talk about in just a moment, display, performance of certain kinds of works. When we talk about an original work, 
the standard of originality under U.S. copyright law is very, very low. Um, all it requires, it doesn't require that it be new, it doesn't require that it be novel, it doesn't even require that it be non-obvious. All it requires is that it have some degree of creativity from the claimed author of the work. What is the appropriate degree of cre creativity? There's no way to define that for sure, but one way to do it is to sort of look at case law. There's a famous case called Feist versus Rural Telephone from the U.S. Supreme Court in which the court said, well, a, a white page's phone directory listed alphabetically, and if you remember physical phone directories, the white pages listed alphabetically, that's not enough. That's an obvious thing. It's, it's so obvious. It's so, it's the really not just obvious, but it's the only way to do it as a practical matter. Well, if it's the only way to do it as a practical matter, or if it's just factual, um, and it's just a set of individual facts, that's not enough. But if there's anything beyond that, um, it's, it's going to be enough. So it's really easy to obtain copyright under U.S. law and under copyright law pretty much most places in the world, because copyright law is very much coordinated um, under some international treaties that some of which go all the way back to the 19th century. So it's easy to obtain a copyright. It's actually hard to um, identify works that might be subject to somebody else's copyright sometimes, because there's really not a, a, a um, way to have a meaningful central registry of copyrighted works. You can do that with a patent because you have a specific set of claims. Even then, it's kind of hard to do, but you have a document with a specific set of claims. Copyright, it's impossible to do. So the right is very broad. Um, it can be difficult to identify and clear the right. That creates all kinds of problems with enforcement. And it also creates all kinds of problems for intermediaries who might be making copyrighted material available to others, even if they didn't create the material themselves. That's a significant overlap with communications law, um, because it is the intermediary, the communication provider, making the material available. If they're distributing it, if in some cases they're transmitting it, uh, if in making it available they're reproducing it, or if they're even facilitating infringement, that could be an act of primary or secondary liability infringement by that communications entity. So if we want to kind of manage this, we might have to have some kind of safe harbors and exemptions for the communications entity. Well, here's where we get to a few of these areas of intersection between communications and intellectual property law. So the first broad area is the Copyright Act of 1976 as it relates to cable television. And I gave you an excerpt from the Supreme Court's Aereo decision that gives a nice uh, discussion of that background. So the, the cable, uh, Copyright Act of 1976 amended the Copyright Act of 1909, which was the primary copyright statute in the U.S. before the 76 Act. Now, it did a lot of things substantively to copyright law to bring the U.S. more fully into compliance with an international treaty called the Berne Convention. Uh, it, it dealt with, it changed the, the nature of the term of copyright, it changed the way copyrights are acquired, and those were huge, important changes. In addition to that, the Copyright Act of 1976 dealt with a problem that had arisen relating to cable television. And as you see in the Aereo case, the way cable television first worked, the very earliest versions of cable television, was that in, in some local communities where it was difficult for individual households to basically to get good television reception from over-the-air broadcasts, a large community antenna would be set up. That large community antenna, or it could be in an apartment building or something like that, and the community antenna would take the over-the-air broadcasts and then would distribute the over-the-air broadcast through wire to the individual television sets. Those were the very early rudimentary cable systems, and they developed into kind of 
bigger systems. And the issue that was litigated then was were those community um, television systems infringing copyright by improperly distributing copyrighted broadcast television works. And um, for a number of reasons, the courts all the way up through the Supreme Court decided that no, those community cable television systems were not infringing copyright. They were not technically distributing um, improperly under the Copyright Act. Well, the broadcast companies, of course, didn't like this, and so they argued that the act of retransmitting broadcast television should be deemed an act of copyright infringement. And in fact, that's part of what the 1976 revision to the Copyright Act says. So it adds a transmission right, and it says that the retransmission of something like a broadcast signal is an act of copyright infringement. Well, if that's the case, how do we still have cable television today? Because there was a compromise in the statute. And you'll see this often in copyright law, where there's a new technology, a new uh, business model, a, new, a very important or potentially important new market that is causing disruption in the industry and that's causing conflict with the existing copyright doctrine, sometimes the statute will be changed to create a right that governs the new technology, but then to create uh, a statutory licensing mechanism. So what happens in the 76 Act is that if you qualify as a cable television provider, if, and you fit that definition and qualify as it, at it, and there's an interface here with, with the uh, FCC regulation of cable television, uh, then it's not an act of infringement to transmit if you are paying a statutory license or royalty. Um, so it's not a pure market mechanism. It's not left to just kind of willy-nilly or, or piecemeal, I should say, the market deciding. But the government is regulating the way the market develops, and it's regulating the kind of royalty that the broadcasters get. A, a fairly common kind of solution under copyright law. But it defined very uh, particularly what a cable television company is. Uh, and then there are other developments of it that relate to satellite television. That issue, as we will see, uh, as we read more of the Aereo case and other cases around it, is becoming really hot and important today. I think it's one of the most important areas of new media law today. Because the question is, outside of something that's clearly a traditional cable television company, like you know Comcast or something, when is internet-enabled television a violation of the Copyright Act? Or when is an internet enabled sort of television provider actually functioning as a cable television company entitled um, to the same kind of statutory license? Or when is it not a transmission at all and therefore not infringing? Um, those are really important areas that relate to this question of convergence because this is a place where the law is really impacting control over the, the new ways in which the medium is being used. Okay, I have up here the Digital Performance Rights and Sound Recording Act of 1995. I gave you a, a, a nice little article summarizing some of the provisions of that. We'll talk about it a little bit more when we talk about the law of digital music. Um, but this is dealing with the ability of a holder of rights in a sound recording um, to obtain some kind of royalty for the performance, the playing of that sound recording digitally. Uh, and it relates to the previous way in which uh, there were not rights for the holders of a sound recording right uh, to obtain performance rights for the playing of the song, uh, of, the, of the recording over broadcast radio. I'll talk more about that when we talk about digital music. And then finally, um, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in 1998. And we will spend uh, at least two, two classes talking in a lot of detail about the DMCA. You know, briefly, what does the DMCA do? Well, I mentioned that issue with a uh, communications infrastructure provider potentially being liable for copyright infringement uh, 
for materials that are transmitted over their system, either directly liable or secondarily liable. Um, and, you know, if you're a media provider, if you're a, a record company, you might want that because, you know, it's very hard to track down and really have any meaningful impact on individual, you know, a mass multitude of maybe millions of individual infringers. It's much easier to have a large single entity, a Comcast, for example, to be able to go after. Um, but if, you know, from the policy perspective, certainly if you're the Comcast, you don't want that. And from the policy perspective, you might say, well, I'm not sure we want that because really we want the infrastructure just to be kind of dumb inf infrastructure. We want it uh, to, to not discriminate as to content. Um, and so we, don't, we want to have a safe harbor. So what's a compromise there? We'll see when we look at the DMCA. It attempts a compromise by allowing the owner of an intellectual property right, a copyrighted work, to um, notify the internet service provider and then requires the internet service provider to have a policy where they then take that content down. Um, and then there is some kind of opportunity for the person who put the content up in the first place to contest that notice. Um, and all of this, at least at some point, short of infringement litigation. We will talk about this in a lot of detail. There are some um, particular parts of it, like you know what really contents, what really constitutes notice that they're infringing works. Um, when is it that there's so much pervasive infringement that there should be some kind of constructive or what's called red flag notice? Um, are copyright holders abusing this by sending too many? takedown notices? Do the copyright holders have to take into account the question of fair use before they send in those? A variety of things like that that, are, that have been litigated and are being litigated as we speak um, that are really fundamentally important for this area. So uh, this is our basic overview, convergence, uh, background of communication law, background of IP law, the intersection of communication and IP law, and those are the topics that we'll continue to be talking about throughout the semester. So this is the end of the lecture, and I will see you at our in-person meeting on Thursday.